Sur le lancement des lignes directrices sur la dépénalisation des délits mineurs en Afrique, aujourd'hui, c'est un travail qui a été mené pendant un certain temps avec d'autres acteurs par le rapporteur spécial sur les lieux de détention, les prisons, les lieux de détention et l'action policière. Comme vous le savez, la commission, au fil de son travail, au fil des années, a élaboré euh, beaucoup d'instruments euh, pour euh, euh, essayer euh, d'encourager les États à engager des réformes au plan national euh, qui puissent intégrer les droits de l'homme et aussi euh, euh, favoriser l'accès du plus grand nombre aux services publics de la justice. On l'a vu euh, dans les déclarations euh, des uns et des autres depuis hier, la situation des prisons en Afrique est, est déplorable. La Commission a également adopter plusieurs déclarations visant à formuler des recommandations. La Commission a également adopté des lignes directrices sur les conditions d'arrestation, de garde à vie et de détention en Afrique, euh, connues sous l'appellation euh, de lignes. 2014. Elle a également adopté les lignes directrices, euh, ces lignes directrices, pour euh, qu'ensemble nous puissions effectivement voir comment améliorer les traitements des personnes. Ces lignes directrices donnent euh, des orientations sur les mesures que les États doivent prendre pour garantir qu'une arrestation ne soit jamais fondée sur une discrimination de quelque nature qu'elle soit. Tous ces instruments contiennent des recommandations, comme je l'ai dit, et qui, euh, si elles étaient mises en œuvre par les États, pouvaient aboutir à la réduction de la surpopulation carcérale, pouvaient également promouvoir des programmes de réhabilitation, de réinsertion, en sachant que les administrations pénitentiaires ont une responsabilité euh, sur ces questions et euh, encourager également les meilleures pratiques qui soient et également la promotion de la Charte africaine des droits de l'homme et des peuples. Également euh, promouvoir euh, un contexte où euh, la justice pénale peut effectivement euh, être humanisée et euh, intégrer les normes des droits de l'homme. C'est ainsi donc euh, que euh, la Commission africaine avait commencé d'abord par adopter une résolution sur la nécessité de définir les principes relatifs à la dépénalisation des, instruments mi et des infractions mine mineures en Afrique lors déjà de sa 21e session extraordinaire. Après l'adoption de cette résolution, il y a eu deux réunions consultatives tenues par les parties prenantes, dont certaines sont ici avec nous, euh, qui interviennent dans le maintien de l'ordre, de la justice et euh, dans des domaines connexes et ayant un intérêt ou un, une expertise spécifique sur euh, la question de la dépénalisation des infractions mineures. La Commission a ensuite adopté les principes lors de la 61e session ordinaire tenue ici à Banjul du 1er au 15 novembre 2017. Ces principes sont destinés à donner des orientations et à guider les États sur les mesures pouvant être prises 
pour renforcer la protection des droits de l'homme euh, au niveau donc, euh, des questions relatives à la justice pénale. Si les principes sont mis en œuvre, comme on l'a dit, ils auront euh, infailliblement un impact positif sur la protection des droits de l'homme, surtout et profiteront aux plus vulnérables, aux démunis, et euh, vont permettre d'éviter ou en tout cas de réduire sensiblement les violations des droits de l'homme dans le contexte de la euh, justice pénale. Euh, nous avons euh, comme panéliste aujourd'hui, euh, au titre euh, des États partis, euh, toujours euh, le Malawi, Pacharo Kaira, euh, auquel nous allons donner la parole pour nous dire, euh, effectivement, dans ce domaine, ce que euh, le, Mal le Malawi fait et qu'est-ce que le Malawi fait de bien. Nous allons donc, sans tarder, euh, donner la parole à, au représentant M. Pacharo Kaira, qui était avec nous déjà sur le premier panel. Vous avez euh, donc euh, cinq minutes. Merci. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam Chairperson. Uh, as Malawi, are honored to be part of this panel. Uh, Malawi was heavily involved in the process of developing these guidelines. And uh, our country has been a, a focal country in terms of strong advocacy towards the decriminalization of petty offenses. Um, as a brief background to uh, where we're coming from and where we are, uh, our penal code, which contains most of these offenses which fall within the category of petty offenses, was reviewed uh, in the last few years. And uh, during the review process, which was led by the Malawi Law Commission, it was essentially thought that um, these bit offenses should still remain on our statute books, such that when this review process was concluded uh, and the penal code was amended around 2010, 2011, most of these offenses remained on our statute books. Then and now, we would say that uh, opinion is still divided as to whether uh, Malawi should fully uh, decriminalize these petty offenses. And it is our view that uh, this debate, for those who believe that these offenses should be decriminalized, as well as those who strongly believe that they should still remain on our statute books, we believe that this debate and this discussion is very healthy and we encourage it. <coughs> However, it took the High Court uh, to make a decision uh, that one of such petty offenses was essentially declared to not to be in line with our constitution. We thought that that was the clearest indicator that maybe it was time for us to take a comprehensive review of our laws and look at such petty offenses. Now, in terms of going forward, um, uh, following the adoption of, of these principles, uh, we have prepared some sort of like an action plan on how we intend uh, to implement the principles. And we just want to offer a few insights uh, which uh, other states can also develop if it suits their domestic systems. The first thing to be done is to identify a focal point in terms of implementation of these principles. And the focal point essentially is the Minister of Justice and the forum is the National Task Force on the African Charter on Human People's Rights. Uh, we have a National Task Force on, on the African Charter which essentially uh, handles all recommendations, all issues that come from uh, the African Commission. That's the first step. The second step is to identify key stakeholders who would be very key in terms of implementing these principles. We have the, the usual obvious ones like the Malawi Police Service, Malawi Prisons, uh, maybe the Human Rights Commission, but we also need to sit down and do a proper mapping in terms of identifying key stakeholders. Number three, disseminate to all stakeholders. Having identified the key stakeholders, disseminate both electronically as well as hard copies of the principles. Number four, hold consultative sessions on the principles. Uh, it is important for the principles to be explained 
to the stakeholders uh, as clear as possible. It is important for the stakeholders to sit down and look at the principles, discuss the principles uh, uh, extensively. Number five, simplify the principles into user-friendly models as well as a sort of an implementation toolkit. Simplify the principles into user-friendly models such as implementation toolkit. This is something which uh, is working very well for us in terms of the Luanda guidelines and the Robin Island guidelines. Uh, the principles as they are um, make sense maybe to seasoned human rights practitioners, but to some key stakeholders, they may need to be simplified so that can, they can be properly implemented. Number six, assign the principles to particular institutions or stakeholders. I think going through the principles and deciding which, which key stakeholders or institutions will be key as far as the implementation of those principles. Number seven, build a consensus on the principles and priorities for implementation. The principles are many, but it is important to have uh, a consensus on what should start first. What is important as far as uh, various domestic situations exist. Number eight, link the principles to already existing initiatives, such as action plans or policies. The principles coming from the African Commission can easily be linked with other principles or guidelines which the Commission has already developed. I've already talked about the Luanda guidelines, the Robin Island guidelines, so it is important not to implement the uh, principles in isolation, but link them to some already existing uh, plans and policies. And if possible, also, it's important to draw an implementation plan. Um, it's very easy to receive the principles and then forget them. So an implementation plan will have clear timelines, clear institutions which will be responsible for the implementation so that at the end of the day, the principles are properly implemented. So from a state perspective and, and from Malawi's perspective, we would like to commit ourselves, despite saying that um, the jury is still out on this and the, the, the discussions are still going on, the debate is still going on, but as a state, we commit ourselves that uh, these principles will be properly disseminated and implemented and the implementation will, will probably be well reported in our uh, successive periodic reports. Thank you very much. Très, très bien, représentant du Malawi, je crois que euh, cette feuille de route, ce plan national de mise en œuvre euh, dans, dans les différents points, les huit points que vous avez euh, énumérés sont effectivement euh, une source euh, d'inspiration pour tous ceux qui sont là, pas seulement euh, les représentants d'État, surtout les représentants d'État parce qu'ils ont la responsabilité effectivement de travailler avec ces outils, mais surtout également avec euh, les organisations de la société civile et euh, les institutions nationales des droits de l'homme. La parole euh, est à Moréenne, Madame Moréenne Mouissa, Mouissa, qui est responsable du programme, qui va nous donner la perspective des institutions nationales des droits de l'homme. Cinq minutes. Merci. Honorable Commissioner Soyata Maiga, Chairperson of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, Honorable Commissioners, Honorable Representatives of the African Union Member States, Honorable Panelist Members, Distinguished Ladies and Gentlemen, good afternoon. On behalf of the Network of African National Human Rights Institutions, Executive Director Mr. Sebi Hego, it is my singular pleasure and honor to be part of this auspicious launch of the principles on the decriminalization of petty offenses in Africa. I wish to congratulate the African Commission for their coherence work in the development and adoption of numerous progressive soft laws touching on pertinent issues arising from arrest, pre-trial detention, and custody, calling on states to reduce the size of prison populations by adopting strategies to decriminalize petty offenses and minor offenses. 
The commendable efforts of the Commission with support from the African Policing Civilian Oversight Forum and Open Society Foundations has resulted in the principles on the decriminalization of petty offenses, which seeks to set a regional standard, outlining procedural measures that can hasten criminal justice reforms by guiding states to decriminalize petty offenses. Uniquely, this landmark regional soft law further addresses overly broad and vague laws that essentially targets persons on the basis of their social origin, social status, or fortune by criminalizing acts or omissions that are life-sustaining. Contrary to several human rights instruments, including the African Charter, criminalizing petty offenses violates numerous provisions of the African Charter, namely Articles 2, 3, 5, 6, and 18. The misconception and enforcement of these laws is misconstrued to control public nuisance, yet the criminalization of petty offenses created by statutes are meted through arbitrary arrests by law enforcement agencies, enforced in a discriminatory manner, and fairly targeting the poor and vulnerable in society. This, in turn, substantively raises the percentage of pretrial detainees languishing in deplorable detention centers for petty offenses with an adverse socioeconomic impact on their families. NANDRI, a regional network drawing its membership from 44 African national human rights institutions and a member of campaign partners on the decriminalization of petty offenses, some of whom are represented in this room, strives to strengthen and coordinate NHRI's mandate in the promotion and protection of human rights. And we are committed in working closely with the African Commission and our members in advancing criminal justice reforms. In this regard, NANDRI through its project Enhancing the Role of NHRIs in the Decriminalization of Petty Offenses in Africa recently launched a baseline assessment report on 3rd October 2018. And intriguing findings from the report reveal that the most common offense in five African countries, namely Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, Kenya, Malawi, and South Africa, is that of being a common nuisance, as prescribed in either national and or subordinate legislation. Notably, placing reliance on statistics obtained from the International Center for Prison Studies, prisons in the five above-mentioned countries are overcrowded beyond the anticipated official holding capacity, comprising of pretrial or remand detainees, majority of whom are petty offenders and are exposed to a mirage of gross human rights violations. In this regard, NHRIs as independent state bodies with constitutional and statutory mandate continue to play a vital role. Particularly, their broad mandate, as enshrined in Article 26 of the African Charter and the United Nations Paris Principles, include human rights protection, promotion, creating a national culture of human rights where tolerance and equality thrive and an enabling environment of human rights is created, and secondly, human rights protection, helping to identify and investigate human rights abuses, seek justice and redress for victims of human rights violations where the mandate permits and advice for remedies of address. In the context of decriminalization of petty offenses, NHRIs are instrumental in the implementations of the principles through the following strategies. The first is to raise awareness of the principles amongst both state and non-state actors in the criminal justice sector. Secondly, to work closely with the African Commission, Special Rapporteur on Prisons, Conditions of Detention and, and Prisons in Africa, and the Committee for the Prevention of Torture in Africa in the promotion of the implementation of the principles. Thirdly, continuous collaboration with state and non-state actors through the development of national action plans for the implementation of the principles. Fourth, to advise the state to develop memorandums for our respective law reform commissions and parliament to create an enabling environment to undertake review of existing laws, policies, and administrative measures with a view to identify areas for reform in line with international and regional human rights standards to also monitor state compliance in the implementation of international and regional human rights please, frameworks. Some lies, some lies, please. For, yes, madam. For persons deprived of their liberty and report on the state of human rights at the United Nations level, at the African Commission level, and in our respective parliaments. 
We also, NHRIs will encourage states to decongest prisons by utilizing imprisonment as a, as a measure of last resort. And lastly, they will conduct detention monitoring visits in places of detention to gather data and information on petty offenders. However, challenges faced by NHRIs in, the in promoting the decriminalization of petty offenses is the existence of these petty offenses in our national and subordinate, subordinate laws and the lack of adequate allocation of resources to NHRIs. We therefore recommend to state parties of the African Charter to establish and support NHRIs with strong legal framework, adequate allocation of resources to effectively undertake their mandate as independent state entities and to move sw swiftly in the implementation of the principles. Thank you all for according me your undivided attention. Merci, Maureen. Uh, nous allons donner la parole à Monsieur Shumil Sali, chargé de programme, chargé de projet, c'est ça? <laughs> Merci. You have five minutes, please. Thank you, hey, Madam Chairperson. My correct name is Shumil Sali. Uh, Madam Chairperson, the Honorable Commissioners, all protocols observed. On behalf of the African Policing Civilian Oversight Forum and its 15 civil society organizations and NHRI partners in the campaign for the decriminalization and declassification of petty offenses in Africa, I would like to commend the Commission, the African Commission, for their cooperation, coordination, and the engagements in developing the guidelines on the decriminalization of paid offenses in Africa. The cooperation between civil society organizations and the African Commission is necessary and important in protecting the, the human rights in our continent, especially the rights of the most vulnerable persons, the poor and the marginalized. The campaign for the decriminalization and declassification of paid offenses started as a result of work undertaken to promote the Luanda guidelines and reform of pre-trial justice systems, which found that many people were in detention for long periods of time for petty offenses such as being a rogue, vagabond, partying in public, loitering, and being an ideal and disorderly person. The objective of the campaign is to advocate for the decriminalization and declassification of petty offenses in Africa. The campaign focuses on paid offenses, which are defined as minor offenses for which the punishment is prescribed by law to carry a warning, community service, a low value fine, or short term of imprisonment, often for failure to pay, to pay the fine. The existence and enforcement of petty offenses has a disproportionate impact on the poor, the marginalized, and vulnerable groups, and the campaign seeks to advocate for the rights of these communities. And the key message of the campaign is that poverty is not a crime. Decriminalize and declassify laws targeting the poor. The campaign's target audience is very wide. It reaches out to those affected by the laws creating petty offenses, including the vendors, homeless people, sex workers, street children, though, and those that enforce the laws, such as the law enforcement officials, including the prosecutors, the magistrates, judges, and local and regional social organizations, and the regional bodies. We encourage all interested parties to join our campaign. For more information, you can visit our website, which is pettyoffenses.org. The principles are an important first step in promoting more just system of criminal justice on our continent. However, the Commission and all the stakeholders must make concerted efforts to implement the principles within the broader paradigm of poverty reduction, equitable and sustainable development, and justice. Accordingly, as campaign partners, we issue this, this, this call of action to civil organizations and state parties. We call, we call on state parties to create mechanisms for broader poverty eradication agenda and not criminalize the poor who seek to partake in economic activities to alleviate poverty. Homelessness, partying in public, and begging signal the failure to create inclusive economies. Let us not criminalize 
the consequences of our economic failures. There should be a social justice response on poverty and not a criminal justice response. National laws and, by and bylaws that discriminate against the poor and the marginalized groups are unjust and must be repealed. We call on African states <clears throat> to not only welcome the adoption and the launch of the guidelines on decriminalization of petty offenses, but to ensure that petty offenses are decriminalized and declassified. We call on civil society organizations and states to promote the implementation of the, of, of the, of the guidelines. We also call on states and civil society organizations to support democratic and human rights policing practices to build trust between the police and the public and eliminate harmful policing practices such as arbitrary arrest, unnecessary detention, excessive use of force, and extortion. We call on states and civil society organizations to encourage dialogue on the use of constructive alternatives to arrest and prostitution to deal with problematic behaviors in public spaces that do not pose a threat to public safety. We call on CSOs to engage in strategic litigation where necessary to accelerate and strengthen the decriminalization and declassification of petty offenses. We call on civil society organizations and states to implement the SCHPR principles on decriminalization of petty offenses to rid ourselves of colonial era crimes and other proprietary forms of law enforcement. Our call is that poverty is not a crime. Let us work together to, air, to end the criminalization of petty offenses and to promote fair systems of criminal justice. I thank you. Merci. Je oublié, j'ai oublié de préciser que M. Chimil Sali est euh, le représentant du forum sur la surveillance civile du maintien de l'ordre en Afrique. APCOP, qui a été euh, un partenaire privilégié et stratégique de, euh, de la rapporteure ou du rapporteur sur euh, les détentions, les prisons et l'action policière. Maintenant, je me tourne vers euh, la représentante de Open Society Foundation. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair, for inviting me to speak on this panel. Um, just to clarify before I continue, I'm not presenting the pictures in the corridor. Those are very beautiful pictures of the albinism campaign. Um, this is really to talk to you specifically about the campaign to decriminalize petty offenses. And I think what my role is here this, mor uh, this morning is just to clarify the difference between what we all consider to be a crime that should go through the criminal justice system and the offenses that we are talking about in these principles. Um, so what I'm going to do is very quickly go through them. I'm not sure that I'll be able to go through all of them, but we'll, we'll give it a try. So, so the first set of pictures I want to show you are what we call making a living. Street traders across the continent, as you'll all know, struggle to make a living and often end up hawking on the streets. These traders are simply trying to make ends meet and are targeted by the police who use these laws to extort bribes, to arrest and to imprison. So the first picture, um, no, we're on the second one now. <laughs> okay, so we're going to stay with that picture. This is Mayiso Gwanda, who I'm very pleased to tell you has traveled with us to the Gambia. Mayiso um, is a bag seller who was accused of being a rogue and a vagabond. And I wanted to specifically mention him because this is the complainant in the Malawi case where the court ruled that the, the offense of being a rogue and a vagabond was unconstitutional. And uh, the reason I highlight this particular picture is because the rogue and vagabond laws are prolific across the continent in all of the um, ex-British colonies. So I really call on our Anglophone uh, brothers and sisters to look at that uh, uh, offense very clearly. The next picture, this is Kadiatu. She is a widow and a mother of seven, and she's popularly known as Go Throw Away. And she is constantly harassed by the police for selling without a permit, even though she does, in fact, have a permit. Um, the next picture, Danielle, is a licensed bus conductor who was released just a few minutes before this picture was taken and had spent time in prison on the charge of touting, which, for, which many of you will know is attempting to get people to fill up a taxi or a bus. 
Um, the next is a picture from Accra. These are drivers of motorcycle taxis who are harassed by the police despite being an alternative, an, an only alternative and an, an affordable source of transport for residents uh, in Ghana. The next set of pictures we've entitled On the Edge. This is really trying to illustrate the vulnerability of people who are targeted by these offences. My uh, fellow panellists have mentioned that the most vulnerable and ostracised, including sex workers, street children, people with disabilities and the homeless, are often the ones that are most vulnerable to these laws. They also tend to have the least capacity to pay bribes and fines and uh, to fight the abuse. So the, uh, the next picture is Scoria who is a sex worker who has been arrested, arraigned in court and fined several times. Um, and I want to point out here that she's not been arrested for sex work. She's been arrested on being idle and disorderly or for loitering. Um, the next picture is Hope. This is a, hopeless, uh, a homeless minor and he seeks food and shelter at Good Hope Children's Home. And when the police start raiding the streets of Blantyre, uh, he's chased away. Um, I think this is the plight of many street children. The next picture, is Adama. Adama is a professional hairstylist and sex worker who shares many stories of harassment, arrest and assault. The next picture, also a sex worker, Vic B, um, is a, a, a victim of domestic abuse and was asked to pay a bribe uh, when he tried to report his abuser and unable to pay the bribe would end up in prison. Um, Lydia, the next picture, is a hawker who had all her belongings burnt by the Askaris in Nairobi um, and lost her child in the mayhem and is still trying to track down her, her child. Um, the next set of pictures, um, on the inside, um, often victims of these laws end up in overpopulated prisons and jails, either waiting for their day in court or serving a sentence. Sometimes they serve a sentence simply because they cannot afford bail or a court fine. Their livelihoods and their families are directly impacted by the time spent in prison. So the next picture is taken in Freetown Female Correctional Center, where the vast majority of people are serving sentences for loitering um, or disorderly behavior or civil debt. Um, the next picture, Abdulaziz is a fisherman arrested while drinking tea and he's serving 15 days in prison because he couldn't afford the fine. Um, next, we see a picture of Blantyre Prison in Malawi, built for 800 inmates and currently serving 2,000 um, inmates. Again, to reiterate that the vast majority of these people are there on offences which do not constitute or meet the threshold for what we would um, um, term a crime. Um, the next picture is Joyce. Joyce's husband is serving two months in prison and the loss of income has already taken um, an enormous toll on the economic stability of his family. Um, all right, so the next picture is Diana Karedza. Uh, she's the principal magistrate um, at Shanzu Court in Mombasa, who's been in the, in the system for 20 years and presides over a lot of petty offences cases. She argues that the courts should have empathy and see themselves as being part of the community. Um, I'm just worrying about time. I've got three more slides. No? Okay, so I really just want to end by saying four very quick things. The first is I want to salute the progressive judgment of the Malawi court in the Rogan Vagabond case. The second is that I want to uh, welcome the move by the Chief Justice in Kenya to uh, create a task force and gazette a task force to review petty offences in Kenya. Um, we are also very encouraged by the jurisprudence that's emerging from the ECOWAS court. Um, and we look forward to hearing the deliberations by the African Court on the filing that's currently before them on the consonance of these offences with the African Charter. So the last thing I want to say is that the, the Petty Offences Photo Exhibition, this was a selection of pictures, will be opened at 5.30 this afternoon in the marquee. There will be refreshments served. Please join us for that. Thank you. Merci, uh, Louise. Maintenant, euh, l'honneur me revient de passer la parole à la commissaire euh, Jamisina King, qui est la présidente du groupe de travail sur les droits socio-économiques et culturels, et qui intervient ici au nom de l'honorable commissaire euh, Maria Teresa Manuela, rapporteure spéciale sur les prisons, les conditions de détention et l'action euh, policière en Afrique.
Jamisina. Thank you very much, Chair. Honorable Chairperson of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, Honorable Members of the African Commission, Representatives of State Parties, Representatives of National Human Rights Institutions, Representatives of Non-Governmental Organizations, Distinguished Ladies and Gentlemen. It is a great pleasure for me today to launch the Principles on the Decriminalization of Petty Offenses in Africa on behalf of the Special Rapporteur on Prisons, Conditions of Detention, and Policing in Africa. These principles, as you heard earlier, were adopted by the Commission during its 61st Ordinary Session in Banjul, the Gambia, from the 1st to 15th of November 2017. Following the Pan-African Conference on Prison and Penal Reforms in Africa, held in 2002, the Commission adopted in 2003 the Ouagadougou Declaration and Plan of Action on Accelerating Prisons and Penal Reforms in Africa. The declaration recognizes that although progress has been made in raising prison standards in Africa through the implementation of the Kampala Declaration on Prison Conditions, significant challenges still remain. And one of the challenges is prisons overcrowding. To address prison overcrowding, one of the strategies identified by the declaration is to reduce overcrowding through inter alia, reducing the number of people entering the prison system by decriminalizing petty offenses such as being a rogue, a vagabond, loitering, prostitution, failing to pay debts, and disobedience to parents. These are just a few of them. The, the Commission, in response to concerns about the extent to which the enactment in interpretation and enforcement by state parties of criminal laws and bylaws comply with Articles 2, 3, 5, 6, and 18 of the African Charter, and in particular to reduce prison overcrowding, improve the justice outcomes for the poor and marginalized, and promote human rights, adopted a resolution on the need to develop principles on the decriminalization of petty offenses in Africa in March of 2017. <coughs> Following this, the Commission conducted research and held various consultations on the issue. Recognizing that decriminalization of petty offenses is an important human rights issue, the Commission adopted these principles. This new soft law of the Commission advocates for a holistic approach to the challenges that arise in Africa at the intersection between poverty, justice, and human rights. It therefore seeks to guide states on measures that can be taken <coughs> to enhance human rights protection at the criminal intersection of poverty and criminal justice. The core purpose of the guideline is to guide states on how to decriminalize and declassify these offenses. The principles establish guidelines against which petty offenses created by law or by law should be assessed and promote measures that can be taken by states to ensure that laws do not target persons based on their social origin, social status, or fortune by criminalizing life-sustaining activities. At this juncture, I would like to give a brief presentation of the principles which are in four languages of the African Union. The principles are divided into six parts, each dealing with different aspects of petty offenses in relation to the relevant rights in the Charter. Part one deals with the definition section and it illustrates the meaning to specific key words used in the document. Part two explains the purpose for the adoption of the principles and part three deals with petty offenses being inconsistent with the articles in the Charter, which relate to the right to equality and non-discrimination. And it states that laws that create petty offenses are inconsistent with principles of equality before the law and non-discrimination on the basis that they either target or have a disproportionate impact on the poor, vulnerable, and key populations or on the basis of gender. 
Part 4 illustrates that petty offenses are inconsistent with Article 5 of the African Charter on the right to dignity and freedom from torture, cruel, inhuman, or degrading punishment and treatment. It specifies that petty offenses are inconsistent with the right to dignity and freedom from ill treatment on the basis that their enforcement contributes to overcrowding in places of detention or imprisonment, which amounts to ill treatment. Part 5 explains how petty offenses are inconsistent with Article 6 of the African Charter on the right to liberty and security of the person and freedom from arbitrary arrest and detention. It provides specific criteria or standards on how states can comply with Article 6 of the Charter in the enactment, interpretation, and enforcement of petty offenses. The last section, Part 6, emphasizes on the need for state parties to decriminalize petty offenses in accordance with the principles and other regional and international human rights instruments. As dem demonstrated in Part E, this section also provides measures to which state parties can ensure that laws and their enforcement comply with these principles and other regional and international human rights standards. They include decriminalizing petty offenses, providing alternatives to arrest, alternatives to arrest and detention for other minor offenses which are not de decriminalized, and I think some countries are, have already instituted some of these measures, community service, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But most importantly, and from the perspective of my mandate, is that this part also highlights the need to address the root causes of poverty and other marginalization. It also requires state parties to adopt specific and general measures to give effect to these principles. And I'm happy to hear about the um, steps taken by Malawi following the High Court decision to have an implementation plan on how they would take steps to decriminalize some of these petty offenses, as well as what is happening in Kenya, who have already, um, um, that, um, steps that have already been taken in Kenya and in other countries. The success of these principles in promoting pre-trial justice will be measured by the extent to which they are known and implemented by state parties to the African Charter. It is imperative that state parties commit to implementation and that they do so with the support of other national stakeholders to decriminalize petty offenses. I therefore want to encourage all stakeholders to use the principles to inform their work to strengthen human rights protection in the national criminal justice system. On behalf of the Special Rapporteur, Honorable Maria Teresa Manuela, I would like to take this opportunity to sincerely thank everyone and every institution that contributed in one way or another to the development of these principles and those already engaged in advocating for its implementation. A sincere appreciation goes to all dedicated partners, the African Policing Civilian Oversight Forum, APCOF, Open Society Foundation's Human Rights Initiative, NANRI, and PALU for the immense support and guidance provided during the consultation process and publication of these principles. The Commission looks forward to a continued collaboration and support in the implementation process would also like to thank all state parties, national human rights institutions, and civil society organizations who provided their expertise during the consultation process. Thank you all for your attention. And at this juncture, together with the chair and all of us at the high table, can we just stand and launch these very important principles on the decriminalization of petty offenses in Africa? Merci, merci, commissaire, merci aux panélistes de la session. Merci.